I love superhero movies, especially those origin story movies. You know, those are the ones that explain where did the superhero come from? How did he become the way that he is? Well, this fall, we are looking at the origin story of Jesus. Where did he come from? How did he become the way that he is? We'll see what Jesus was about before his official ministry started in the sermon series, Firm Foundation, the origin story of Jesus. Believe it or not, your origin story begins with Jesus as well. You see, as we learn from Jesus' story, it will shape your story, making it more exciting, more fulfilling, and more adventurous than ever before. Join us on Sundays this fall for our series, Firm Foundation, the origin story of Jesus. Well, good morning. I know that many of you have been with us. You'll know that we are in our fall sermon series right now, and this is the uh, seventh sermon, actually, in our sermon series called Firm Foundation, the origin story of who? Jesus. Yeah, you can cheat. You can look on the bulletin. It just says it right there. This is the origin story of Jesus. So as we've been uh, going through this series, it's, we've been uh, comparing Jesus to like a superhero origin story uh, that we're learning in Luke how Jesus became Savior of the world, focusing on the backstory before his ministry goes public uh, in the book of Luke. That's the first several chapters in Luke. And so that's been our sermon series. Now today we are taking a look at a new text, um, you know, that last Sunday, Pastor Greg introduced uh, the uh, forerunner to Jesus, John the who? Baptist. That's very good. John the Baptist. And today, we're going to hear a piece of uh, John's fiery sermon. <laughs> so with that, before we go to our scripture, let's pray that the Lord would illuminate his word into our lives. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... Uh, in your word, we encounter you. We thank you that we get a glimpse here of John the Baptist's words preparing the way for you. Uh, so, Lord, we pray that as we enter into the, this text, you would prepare us for you, you entering into our lives through your word, which is accompanied by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, enter into our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lives, that we can give all of ourselves back over to you, transforming us, Lord, to be the people you're calling us to be. And we know that you're going to do this because we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. Let's listen now for God's word for us. And as we read this text, imagine John the Baptist is preaching at us, preaching at you. <clears throat> John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation... And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. 
He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, let me get this first observation out there on the table. John the Baptist was not Presbyterian. I mean, he's just way too yelly. Come on, brood of vipers, John. When was the last time you were yelled at? When was the last time you were yelled at for your beliefs? When was the last time someone yelled at you challenging your faith? When was the last time somebody yelled at you unraveling your religion? That's John the Baptist. You know, um, it's not a great feeling, is it? When, uh, when getting my uh, PhD, a fellow doctoral student named Paul constantly challenged me on Christianity, constantly challenged my faith. As a matter of fact, he called all religions just myths, and he was really worked up about that. I have to be honest, though, I actually really liked Paul, but he was not easy. He was not easy, especially that one time when he even challenged my faith in the graduate building lobby in front of an unwilling audience. It was not great for anyone. Even Paul, I would say. There actually must have been more to Paul's story because at the end of the semester, he actually came around and he apologized. I don't know what God's work was doing in his life, but there was something happening there. But here, here, uh, John the Baptist in our text, John the Baptist is yelling, challenging the faith of this crowd, and he is not apologetic. Brood of vipers, he says. Brood of vipers in the Greek is literally... You offspring of poisonous snakes. John is insulting your mama. (laughs) Come on, John. This is not a good stewardship sermon tactic. But here we are today. I mean, honestly, we do not like being called names and having our mothers insulted. And yet... Our text ends, verse 18, ends there by calling John's words good news. This isn't even nice news. How can vipers bear fruit? Why is John shaking our faith when we need a firm foundation? Where is the good news in John's yelling and name calling? Well, believe it or not, here's why John is yelling. It's all about Abraham. You see that in verse 8. You know that, right? This Jewish crowd, they, these people are descendants of whom? Abraham. This is Abraham. Abraham, who, whom God made an everlasting covenant with. It was children, his children's children. This crowd, these are his children. God's chosen people, right? Well, John challenges their faith, saying, don't be smug because Abraham is your dad. God can get covenant children anywhere, even from these rocks. John is saying that they're more children of snakes than children of Abraham. Salvation isn't their birthright, he's saying, so don't be smug. Ethnic religiosity does not save you. I don't know about you, but this puts me on the spot. I mean, is this us? Are we smug in our faith? Are we resting on our religiosity? 
I mean, come on, we're Presbyterians. We know what we're talking about. We got the whole package, right? We're good. We know our religion. We're good. With, but are we smug? Well, that's what John the Baptist is yelling at us about. Where's this good news in John's yelling? Why is he shaking our faith when we need a firm foundation? So John, John, what should we do? What should we do to bear good fruit? Well, that's what the crowd asks. Right there in verse 10. You know, as I was reading this text and researching it, uh, I came across one of my favorite theologians and scholars, N.T. Wright. Maybe many of you know N.T. Wright. In light of this text, he shared the story of an entitled skeptic shouting up at heaven, God, if you're up there, tell us what to do. And alarmingly, a voice from heaven booms back. Feed the hungry, house the homeless, establish justice, give away your money and your possessions. And overwhelmed, the skeptic says, I was just testing. And the voice booms back, yeah, me too. <laughs> you see, that's what the people were asking in verse 10. Maybe they were testing. They're saying, what should we do? And like that skeptic, the answer is overwhelming. You see, John doesn't do the nice religious answer. John uh, doesn't call for the standard repentance they're expecting. Put on sackcloth, wear ashes. No, he doesn't talk about sackcloth and ashes. John's repentance, that he, the one he calls for is a radicalization of loving one's neighbor to the point of personal sacrifice. He says, stop getting rich at the expense of others. Stop abusing your power. St and stop keeping too much for yourself. Give everything away with no thought of self-gain. That's overwhelming. And John calls them to radical generosity, saying, essentially, put your money where your mouth is. John is saying, don't just say you're a child of God. Live like one. Now that's fruit bearing stewardship, really, with your whole life. Don't just claim the faith, live it. See, living it is our response to God's blessings, making stewardship a central spiritual practice, returning our lives to God, returning our time, our talents, and our treasures back to God is living our faith. Don't just claim the faith, live it. But doesn't John the Baptist know radically generous stewardship is impossible? Come on, this is overwhelming. I mean, I can never be generous enough, never help my neighbor enough, never give to the church enough, never be patient enough, never love my enemy enough. Oh no, we need a firm foundation. So where's the good news? And John yelling at us. He yells, brood of vipers and unquenchable fire, and he insults our mothers. And so the people in our text receive all this fire, and they wonder. They wonder if he's the Messiah. <laughs> and John says, oh, you think I'm harsh? Wait till dad gets home. You think I'm harsh? Wait until the real Messiah shows up. Oh, you will be in for it. Yikes, this is scary news. And then verse 18 says that John's message is good news. How is it good news when it isn't even nice news? Well, we actually know the answer to that, don't we? I mean, this whole text is set in this context. This is the origin story of whom? Jesus. So don't you see? When Jesus comes, when, when forgiveness and grace 
are available in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who is the judge, then judgment is good news. <laughs> judgment is good news. You see, Jesus, the mighty judge, is also the mighty savior. Now, friends, that's not just nice news. That is really good news. His judgment comes with the forgiveness and grace that he paid for on our behalf, transforming us through the grace of the cross, transforming us from vipers into fruit bearers, transforming us from snakes into trees, transforming us from judged into forgiven. That's the kind of judge I want over my life. That's the kind of good news I need. I don't want nice news. I want good news. How about you? Hey, John, thanks for yelling. You see, don't just say you're a child of God. Live like one. But how can we live like that? How can we live with radical, self-sacrificial generosity with everything in our lives? Well, I saw how. As many of you know, I joined uh, a couple months ago our mission team to the Ashiel mountainous region of Guatemala. Yeah, the indigenous people there live with extreme poverty. And, I, and when I say extreme, you can't even imagine how extreme this poverty is. Extreme poverty, extreme malnutrition. As a matter of fact, the malnutrition strikes children uh, ages five and younger most severely in that region. Uh, but our work alongside one of our mission partners, Agros, is changing that. So I want to tell you about Katerina. Katerina is... Uh, She's a small Ishiel woman with long black hair who wears vibrantly colored clothes, the clothes of Guatemala. Katerina has six children and one infant strapped to her back. Her husband works long days down the mountain in town. As a matter of fact, he leaves so early in the morning and gets back so late at night that I, I never actually got a chance to meet him. But Agros has taught Katerina now how to farm her land, providing food for her children and providing an income. This is marvelous transformation. And Katerina showed us her plank home and, and the, her sprouting crops with her eyes just beaming. And if you're part of us, if you're part of Lake Grove Church, you actually help transform Katerina's life through missions like this. It was wonderful to see her life there. And, and before leaving, uh, we all stood in a circle. Our, the, the mission team there, the other Guatemalans nearby, uh, Katerina and her Shield family, we all stood in a circle uh, with her family and the Agros team members as I prayed. And as I prayed, something beautiful happened. It was actually unexpected and at first, I was really confused at what was going on. You see, as I prayed, I heard a, um, a whispering noise really low that started to grow. And then that whispering noise rose louder as I prayed. And then it slowly dawned on me that it was Katerina in the Ishiel language praying alongside me. And then as she prayed, the other Ishiel voices joined in. And then Spanish voices rose up, joining in as well. And Katarina's prayer started taking over the prayer that I thought I was praying. And Katarina's prayer took over as she dedicated all she has and all she is to Christ. You see, her prayer wove the English and the Ishiel and the Spanish together, rising up, glorifying God. Friends, in that moment, this was a taste of heaven. I believe this was a taste of heaven when we know that all languages from the far reaches of the earth will join together, weaving together as one voice, praising God together. It was beautiful. That taste of heaven, I wish you could have been there. And as we prayed, this prayer became Katerina's prayer, consecrating 
all she had to God's glory and purposes. Can we do that? You see, consecration comes from the Latin, two Latin words, con meaning with, and sacrare meaning sacred. Consecration means joining something with the sacred. That's what Katerina was doing. And like Katerina, that's what we will do next Sunday. We'll have a time to join together. We'll have a time to join all that we have and all that we are with Christ, the sacred one. Consecration as we consecrate our lives to him. And as you know, the wise leaders here, the leaders that you voted into place, steward these resources to best partner with Christ who transforms the world one life at a time. And today at the mission fair, you will see how your support ripples out to the world like that. It's a radically generous way of joining our story with the sacred origin story of Jesus. So don't don't just say you're a child of God. Live like one. That's what John the Baptist says. So, friends, embrace the real origin story of Jesus. Don't just claim the faith. Live it. It'll make your story more exciting, more fulfilling, and more solid than ever before. That's because he will give you a firm foundation. Amen.